and welcome once again. You're listening to the voice of Free Arcadia. We're back. It's just about to be the new year, so I hope we're going to bring in 2023 uh, with gusto and doing it with uh, a great friend of the podcast, John Mercury Falcon. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Happy New Year. Yeah, happy happy New Year and your channel on YouTube has had a ton of growth this year. You've you've doubled, right? I didn't double. My goal was to double because okay. I started at 15k. I wanted to get to 30k. Oh, okay. I'm right. at like almost 26k though. And you just did a really awesome video on Captain Harlock, uh, a hero for losers, sort of to to truncate what your theme was about there. Yeah, and and surprisingly, it is my most successful scripted video I've ever made on the channel. I'm not the surprised. Video that. The only video on my channel that's actually done better is the compilation I made of Speed Racer shooting people that yeah. I made on a whim as a joke and iconic got all across the internet and became a bit of a meme. Uh, mm-hmm. That one's got millions of views, so haven't haven't broken that ceiling yet. But Harlock video surpassed 200k views, my most successful scripted video. Uh, very happy with it, and I hope to do more Leiji Matsumoto stuff like that. I hope you do too, and uh, you were very kind to our YouTube channel as well, which experienced great growth uh, just from pinning our comment, and and I'm grateful you you let me uh, contribute in any way, even just to talk about Harlock a little bit. So, and I learned uh, about Harlock and and it's their context in, in the 70s as well through that video. So, not to make this a Harlock video, but it's a great video. Go check it out. But today we're going to be talking all about Space Battleship Yamato, aka Star Blazers, and we're going to focus mostly, uh, entirely, on the first movement, I would call, of the, of the story, the quest for Iskandar, as it's been labeled on some DVD packaging I've seen. So, uh, And I think it's an appropriate description of that first movement. And a bunch of different iterations, too, right? Uh, we were just going through them. John, what are all the iterations again? <laughs> For, well, for the recording, the I've seen, I'll start with the ones I've seen and then what I haven't seen. Uh, there's the original 1974, original Japanese version. There's the compilation film from 1977. You have the two mangas. Also, there's the Star Blazers readaptation, which is the uh, American localized version. Oh, and then, yes. of course, there's the 2013 remake anime. Yes, 2199. It was, I think it was just called Star Blazers 2199 when it first hit. Uh, when it was first localized, but they've extended the title now to Space Battleship Yamato Star Blazers 2199, which also has a manga adaptation uh, that I've dabbled in, (laughs) just just in my toes in. Yeah, so there's a lot here, and John hasn't seen all of it, and I haven't seen uh, the Japanese dub, or, I'm sorry, the original Japanese dub. Uh, I've only seen Star Blazers, so we're gonna kind of compliment each other in that degree. And I'm gonna spoil John on 2199 Live. Cause he 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 said he would watch it all. He couldn't get to it. No harm, no foul, but now you get spoiled, okay? Absolutely. I I you know, having watched 10 episodes, I had some issues with it, and I I had some speculations on where I thought it might go. And I'm very mm-hmm. curious if it goes where I think it's gonna it where I think it was gonna go. It goes in a different direction for sure. Uh, it's a subtle direction, and I don't know. I cried at the end of this thing multiple times. I'm I'm a total sucker for the Matsumoto, you know, string string pulling, heartstring pulling. So I don't know how you how you reacted to all these endings. Well, yeah, uh, with Yamato, uh, I felt like the the first of all the movie I think does the ending. It's a it's a bit weird with the ending of the Yamato film because with the TV show every episode had to have its own self-contained conflict even in the overarching great story yeah. um, and with the film obviously that wasn't the case and so you actually reach a point in the film at the end and sorry to talk about the end already but at the I end asked. once they kind of get to Iskandar and they meet Starsha uh, the movie just kind of resolves itself and that's your that's kind of your epilogue to the whole adventure yeah. from there Whereas with the, yeah, with the TV show, should we should we hold off? Well, let's talk about how those things come to be, right? Those are the first two things that are made 
called Space Battleship Yamato, the anime series and then the movie. So what what makes the anime happen? I what what's your knowledge on the subject? I, I know Nishizaki, it's interesting because it started with him, Matsumoto, and this is something I bring up in my Harlock video. Matsumoto gets the majority of the credit for the anime, but it started with Nishizaki, Yoshinobu Nishizaki. He, uh, his, I mean, his gun and drug charges would lead to him being like swept under the rug on a lot of anime productions he worked on. Uh, yeah. But it started with him. And it's interesting because the idea of the Yamato or a battleship in general being resurrected as a, uh, as like a, a new, like a flying machine. That's not a new concept in Japan no. by a long shot. Nishizaki actually grew up reading a lot of adventure books about battleships being resurrected as flying machines and including one that uh i think was about it was called new battleship yamato and the character of captain okita is originally from that manga uh it's not like a you you could call it plagiarism but it was seen more as an homage to and a throwback to those classic adventure stories for japanese boys well, there's definitely a lot more bleeding between, you know, ideas and themes and and characters and designs in anime and manga than is probably acceptable in the West. I, is that a fair oh, claim yeah, to yeah. make? I, I think, it, yeah, for sure. And I think it's because Japan is so um, because they're, they're such a closed off country. Everyone mm -hmm. who works in those industries kind of knows each other. So it's more of like, a, you know, for the benefit of this industry, it's good not to have bad blood, whereas in the West, I think everyone in Hollywood has bad blood with each other. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the Wild West. We we hold on to that American Wild West attitude. But that that Wild West attitude was definitely something that Nish both Nishizaki and Matsumoto uh, romanticized in their work. They love that kind of and and Nishizaki's history. I mean, let's talk about how this man makes this project happen and how that kind of contrast to the rest of the anime industry he basically is coming off the heels of losing tezuka a bunch of money do you know anything about that yeah i know a little bit about that um i know he was working for mushi pro right at the tail end of mushi pros you know when they had their big fall um and from what i understand maybe you know more about this he pretty much stole the copyright on the anime triton of the sea where he was supposed to file the copyright for Tezuka and he filed it under himself so that he would have the rights to it. So he was always yeah. a shady character. <laughs> Did you mention that in your video where you mentioned the Triton of the Sea anime at all? I don't think I did, no. Okay, okay. So, yeah, and, and you probably know more than about it than me. Uh, that, that was a really well-told uh, account of it. And he's coming off the heels of this you know, kind of scandalous behavior, the, the godfather of all anime to a large degree. And he just scraps together this team with all these resources. I mean, it does kind of seem like, well, this is your do or die moment in this industry. You've you've burned all the bridges you could, and now you got to scrap together this thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what what's funny is that when Mushi Pro was failing in that in that time span, it's around 1972. The anime industry was sort was in a, a really bad place financially. A lot of anime were just not making their money back. Toei was uh, considering dropping, uh, closing Toei Doga, their anime, later Toei Animation. And they were just like, we have these tokusatsu like Kamen Rider that are doing really well. We should just make more of those. And mm. anime is just this big loss. It's, it's uh, anime is over basically between Mushi Pro, Toei was going to close. All, all these other companies were producing Cancel. anime that were failing. Around 73, 74, it started to pick back up again. And so Yamato is on the heels of it. Just anime just had this big loss, and it's starting to be on the come up again. We're starting to see anime that are profitable again. Uh, so Yamato is sort of like that. Uh, it's it's uh, maybe that's why Nishizaki was able to get by because you know so many people had pr left the industry. That they were mm. they were in need of new blood, basically, to reinvigorate yeah. it. Yeah, this was the only opportunity he was going to have to, and he had to do it all from nothing, essentially, not nothing, because mm. he'd obviously had connections. But well, actually, there there were some pretty big names. For example, um, Office, Office Academy is the company that did the animation, and that was founded by Noboro Ishiguro, who I think uh, I've it's a name I've said a million times because he was a direct the director the chief director on 
Super Dimension Fortress Macross. Most okay. people call him, you know, bring up Legend of the Galactic Heroes, which was another big title he did. But I'm big in the Robotech circle, so Ishiguro is a name I that should comes be, up a lot for me. I should be clear that I'm not saying that this team wasn't talented. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm, I might have said that, but what I mean is that this wasn't a very tested team, I, I don't think, in, in regards well, to anime. I'm sure there was a lot of new people because that, you know, like I said, they were kind of bringing in a lot of new blood into the industry. Right. There were some OGs there to guide them, though, like mm -hmm. episode four uh, being storyboarded by Yoshiyuki Tomino of Mobile Suit Gundam fame, who had been working in anime since Astro Boy. So he's been mm -hmm. he's been around. They at least it wasn't like a bunch of uh, a bunch of, like there's a lot of those anime where it's like we brought in all new people. That was a big thing mm -hmm. in the 80s was we're going to bring in all the young people to do this. Um, and that's where you get a lot of like the bringing in the young people is where you get the experimental stuff. And Yamato definitely falls into that. Mm -hmm. But I will say they at least and maybe it's because I'm looking back retrospectively considering how much Ishiguro and Tomino and all those people have done now. Right. But they at least had those guys who was like, I've been here for at least 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, Yamato is still a new thing at the time to do a serialized story like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was really, you know, it was a manga first approach for the large part before Yamato. And uh, then this oh, gets yeah. two manga made at the same time while it's airing. But they don't lead the series, the, the IP. And that's that's also a very common thing with the works of Ishinomori, where um, Toei was so big on producing their tokusatsu. But of course, if Ishinomori is working on it, they want this famous manga author to make a manga as well to cross promote. And you'd see a lot of stuff like that, too, with uh, two mangas. For example, Himitsu Sentai Go Ranger, the first Super Sentai, has two manga as well. One that's a serious manga and one that's a gag manga, just to get all demographics included. <laughs> Right. So that was mainly happening in the Sentai space, the Takusatsu space, but it wasn't happening so much in anime. Is that a correct evaluation? Right. Right. The 1974, I think Yamato's planning started in 72, 73, which is right when a, a couple of studios started saying we should do anime original projects. Uh, mm. Because even even in 72, you have big anime like Mazinger Z. Mazinger Z was still based on a manga. That was originally a manga first. Right. But you did see stuff like Gotcha Man, where it was like, this is an original anime produced for the anime. So this anime is being made. There's a lot of up and comers. Leiji Matsumoto has never touched an anime. He's been given the offer before. And let's talk a little bit about that. I might have some insight there. Um, Matsumoto, before he got the Yamato proposal here, he was given blueprints classified blueprints to the Yamato itself by an elderly neighbor. Uh, he moved into, there was a, there was an apartment complex that a lot of mangaka were in. I think Tezuka might've been in it and Ishinomori, but he decided, now I'm going to go to this other one because I don't want to be, you know, he always wanted to do his own thing. He'd been offered an anime before and he turned it down because he couldn't have full creative control over it. That was his anime goal. And he ends up getting the proposal and turning it down for Yamato because of the same thing. Nishizaki wasn't going to give him everything of his baby, right? And so Matsumoto, he has a moment where he's like, well, I'm, you know, this is bigger than me, right? I, be, I have the blueprints. My father flew over the Yamato in one of his planes as it was destroyed. There, there's ancestral, you know, DNA. I'm, it's, it's all throughout his work. He believes in this kind of deeper personal meaning and, and life story. And he, and he does it. And to some degree, it's the be one of the best things that ever happens to him. And, and in other ways, it, it kind of maybe an albatross. Is that the word I want to use? Well, yeah. Um, I, the thing with Yamato is that it, it, um, it, it was fighting such an uphill battle. And I always felt that that reflected in the anime. Uh, it, mm -hmm. the, you can see when you compare the anime to the compilation film, that the anime is taking a bunch of steps that they are not going to be able to, they're basically putting a lot of stuff on the table that they can't fulfill in the end. Um, and there's a, you know, we can talk about the stuff like uh, having a, originally being set for 39 episodes. 
they get cut down to 26. Leiji Matsumoto seeming to have a different view on personal responsibility and duty compared to Nishizaki. I think that part of it with Nishizaki comes from the fact that he did grow up reading a lot of those books about those boy adventure books, which were essentially propaganda. They're very much yeah. like uh, they're very much like those old pro war Looney Tunes cartoons, essentially. Uh, well, we could even talk about the spider Matsumoto. and the tulip, right? Where uh, Tezuka and and Matsumoto see the same screening of this movie, which is in in essence a Japanese propaganda war film. Oh, I wasn't familiar with that. Definitely. Nishizaki comes from Matsumoto has an edge of this. I think there's an edge of this for all Japanese people after World War II, a, a hint of nationalism, right? Everybody's dealing with this, you know, Japanese identity and what it's going to mean moving into, uh, you know, the 21st century and building that future and the miracle economy taking off and the technological revolution in Japan uh, there's a lot of optimism, but that manifest in maybe more and less toxic ways. And I think maybe Nishizaki represents the former. That's my take. Yeah, yeah. Like I was saying with the uh, Nishizaki is definitely he's I think he's maybe like, what is he? Maybe 15, 20 years older than Matsumoto. Uh, and so it makes sense to hear him that he has these uh, very old school mentality. And he the way he tells the story is very much like those old I don't want to just throw out propaganda as if to say that these uh, those works he grew up with were bad or anything, but they definitely had a different goal in mind. Um, whereas with Leiji Matsumoto, it's very clear that he has a more nuanced view of war, not just saying, and he doesn't even, it's not even just that he says war is bad. He mm -hmm. understands uh, a soldier's mentality and he understands the, the negative aspect of a, a uh, nation that is pushing towards one unified goal. But he also does it with no condemnation of the soldiers is what I'm trying to say. It's much more nuanced and much more modern than I think Nishizaki wanted the story to go. And Matsumoto is a very individualist uh, type of creator. That's in his storytelling. He believes in the power of the individual. That's all throughout Captain Harlock. Uh, it's not as drenched in Yamato is an ensemble cast and it's harder to get these episodes like we get in Harlock where it's like, well, here's the story of this person. We get some, we get, you know, Sonata's story, uh, which ties more into Susumu. Uh, so it's still pretty Susumu centric. Hey, who do you think is the main character of Yamato? It starts, it definitely starts off with Kodai, but it sort of shifts to Okita. There's early on, there's a big focus on the rivalry between Shima and Kodai. And I feel like they kind of shift away from that to do more of uh, Kodai and Okita, which I think that stuff is the most interesting. And like my in my video, I called Harlock the anti-sports anime because Harlock kind of takes this idea of a crew and says that you can be you can work as a crew and still be an individual and have an in individualistic goal. Whereas with Yamato, it's very much like a sports team where everyone should be working for one goal. And this relationship between Kodai and Okita is very much like a, a player, the star player and the coach. Uh, in fact, I, I I don't know if you're familiar with Gunbuster, but uh, the anime Gunbuster draws a lot from Yamato. And the relationship between Noriko and her coach is hugely inspired by Kodai and Okita. Okay. Yeah, I'm not so intimately familiar. I know of it. Uh, that, that's really interesting. I would say that uh, the first scene of Yamato establishes who the main character is. It's Okita opens Yamato, Okita closes Yamato. And you, you see his story uh, play out through it. And you're seeing the youth kind of run around because he's, and he's like reminiscing on his youth through it. There's a lot of like vicarious living vicariously through through the youth. And as a captain, you you definitely do that as a coach of a team. You 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 know, Phil Jackson's not all out there playing for the Lakers when he was uh, coaching them. But he he was just a uh, just as part of that win as the rest of the team. Um, so I definitely get that sports vibe. I was going to actually talk about 
some of the stuff cut from the compilation movie. Can we work up to the movie real quick, though? Because I want to talk about absolutely. Heidi Girl of the Alps. Okay, this is the titanic force in anime that the Yamato originally just couldn't take on. Do you know much about Heidi? I don't. You called it a titanic force. I would call it the iceberg that sunk the Yamato. <laughs> I know that it was very, very popular family anime. It was the anime that uh, when the family sat down, everyone wanted to watch Heidi. Something that is joked was joked about at the time that a lot of boys and their fathers wanted to watch Yamato. But Heidi was airing at the same time. And usually it was the mom who got final say and said, no, 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 we want to watch Heidi. And so the family would wind up watching Heidi and Yamato. It kind of suffered because I'm sure there were days where mom was like, "Okay, you can watch Yamato. But Yamato is a serialized story. You need to watch Mm -hmm. the episodes as they come out in order. And so I'm sure there were days where dad and son watch Yamato and like, oh, we missed a good episode. We missed the last episode. Now we don't know what's happening. And they lose people were losing interest as it was going on. Cause even when they'd get mm. the chance to watch it, they'd be like, Oh, we missed three episodes. So we don't know what's we missed so much. And then they just give it up to mom and let mom and mom and the daughter and the sister watch, watch Heidi. Yeah. I think, I think it's almost a blessing for the Yamato production that the, it, the episodes were cut down. Even if the story does feel rushed towards the end, uh, would it being longer really made it better? And also the production was not fun for Matsumoto, who was making a manga and doing that. I mean, he vowed after the, the end of Yamato, at least the movie, maybe they he would never take on that kind of production schedule again. It was it was too much for everybody. They originally had the show divided into three 13 episode arcs, and they basically said, all right, that last 13 episode arc, that's gone. Um, and I think that that benefited them because I think I, I mentioned in my video that arc was meant to introduce Captain Harlock and start like a new arc. And I think it, if, if anything, it benefited Captain Harlock as a franchise yeah. more that he didn't get forever tied to Yamato, especially when Leiji Matsumoto would be pretty much tired with Yamato due to hating Nishizaki's guts. It very well may have been the case that we never saw that Harlock anime or any of those Harlock sequels or Harlock showing up in Galaxy Express just because he would have been forever tied to Yamato. And I also don't think it would have had as Harlock would have had as an individualist themes because yeah. uh, spoilers, Captain Harlock was actually uh, Suzumu Kodai's older brother, Mamoru Kodai. Uh, and Mamoru Kodai is not a very individualistic character. He's very much that star player on the sports team where he's like, I'll give my life for Captain Okita. Uh, so Harlock would have been a, not only may have we, we, not only may we have not gotten that anime, but Harlock would have been a very different character. I, I do, I do still want to keep talking about this, this, you know, complicated rise from the grave of, of what, you know, Yamato has been cast down into the earth. Is it going to launch again? And that's, there's, it's almost like the themes of the show itself ensured that it would have the, the journey it did. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about star Wars and they talk about, well, star Wars allowed for, uh, Yamato to be successful in Japan because it did good in Japan uh, on larger audiences. And maybe with the, the female crowd, especially, Maybe that's true. Maybe they did open up a little bit more to the concept of, you know, breaking the Uchu curse a little bit here, the, the space sci-fi anime that just didn't get to women maybe as much. Maybe Star Wars opens that. But like you said, the fathers and sons are still the core audience there. It, you know, just it's very chicken and the egg with Star Wars. Yeah, well, with the Star Wars thing, I I mean, I have a theory just... I was re-watching the Yamato film last night to refresh it in my head because the last time I'd watched it, I'd watched it on a plane. So I wanted to actually watch it in the in a better environment. Um, and so I watched it. And the first thing I, I thought about was this version of Yamato is a 1080p Blu-ray rip, and it looks gorgeous. I can see every little detail. But I was imagining watching the Yamato TV series in the 70s on a small CRT and thinking I wouldn't see any of this. In fact, Mm -hmm. seasons two and three of Yamato on the internet right now are the subtitled versions of them are DVD rips and they're not great quality DVD rips. And I don't have a huge drive to watch those. And I think it's because they just don't look as beautiful. So 
you have that Yamato show and it airs on TV and it has its core fan base. But I think that seeing that that art blown up on a movie mm-hmm. screen in the highest quality possible, that, that beautiful film blown up to whatever resolution a movie screen, movie theater screen is, that is what made people realize this is actually a gorgeous show. And I think that's what got people interested. Do you say that when Yamato comes out in 74, it's competitive or do you think it's lagging behind? I think it is competitive because even if the animation, you know, wonky characters looking a little wonky here and there, there's a little, you know, miss paints, uh, ships getting shot and not getting, not exploding or vice versa. You, if you look at the details, the, the scenes of the Yamato ship and the machinery, that is actually very, I would say, ahead of its time. You, you the machinery at, uh, definitely is. Newer. That was the biggest thing Matsumoto was really pushing in the animation department for Yamato was getting these mechanical designs right. The sh- the sets in Yamato are in- the backgrounds are super detailed. They're dense with machinery and and all this stuff going on. And then there's all- anytime the cannons fire or even when they just move, it's so animation intensive right uh mm-hmm. and and these uh the designs for the anime were done by studio new who i think also did work on harlock and they're known for these super detailed mech they'd later do macross with also with ishiguro and also some of the gundam ovas in the 80s and 90s where you get the gundams that look super detailed yeah it's it's cool that so, matsumoto kind of leaves their mark on that whole company in this way then because his his manga style his sci-fi manga style was just that the dense the density of the of the shots and if they're not technically dense they're texturally dense they're these watercolor backgrounds with these splatter paint backgrounds that are very grungy and and he pairs that with these character designs that are conversely very simple Animating Matsumoto's manga style has, I don't think it's ever been easy. They, I don't think they get it right until the Galaxy Express 3.9 movie, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. And that's that's actually something I always thought was funny, even recently, hearing that like these artists in Japan who have more cartoony styles, that's mm. actually difficult for Japanese animators. I was hearing that yeah. uh, even something like uh, Mob Psycho 100, which is from the creator of One Punch Man, it has those very silly, simplistic character designs, and the animation team. I think it was, um, I think it was Studio Madhouse passed it up because they said it was too difficult for them to animate, mm. which is hilarious when you think of Studio Madhouse, who are known for these, yeah. uh, very, very thick lines, these very stylistic-looking shows, and then Mob Psycho is this very simplistic-looking show, almost looks like it's drawn in MS Paint sometimes, and they were like, "We oh, don't want to touch that." <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's how they move their the the cheating that goes on in rotating uh, Matsumoto's characters is is very hard to translate oh, yeah. into animation. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's doing a lot and it's revolutionizing. So I think it it definitely wins a lot of points for all of its uh, new efforts, its novel efforts versus what's going on in the market. I actually don't know much about the compilation film, but I do know it's yeah. very famously quoted that the movie outdid Star Wars when it hit right. theaters. So at least in Japan. We have a lot of Western Star Blazers fans who are probably bigger Star Star Wars fans in a lot of ways. Uh, that old guard uh that that really give Star Star Wars maybe more credit than I think it deserves when it comes to Yamato's success. I'm I'm not saying it wasn't a part of the of the puzzle, but I don't think that Matsumoto owes much to Lucas. I think maybe it's the other way around. I don't know how you feel about that. Here's the thing is that you have a lot of, I don't know if I, pollution might be a word in the anime community where a lot of people want to sort of say this anime inspired this Western movie. Um, mm-hmm. For example, I mean, something that I, I've i dealt with is in the Ishinomori circle. Um, there's a lot of people that say the villain Kikite or Hakaiter in Android Kikaiter was the inspiration for Darth Vader, which mm-hmm. I've I've done a lot of looking into. I cannot find any source, and I don't see any reason why that would be the case. There's actually very clear inspirations for Darth Vader in other works that we know Lucas was was has cited as influences, right? French comics. Um, hey, y'all, this is a website with a blog article that's talking about what I'm talking about. Hey, check it out, Cordian.net. I'll try to link it in the description. I'll really try. 
not necessarily French comics, but like if you look at stuff like uh, uh, obviously he's sort of based on a, a samurai. So there's a bit of a Jedi Geki inspiration right. there. And then also the movie, The Phantom of the Paradise, where the main character is based on the Phantom of the Opera, where he's his face is burned and he has to wear a mask and he uses mm-hmm. an electronic voice box to speak, stuff like that, which we know Lucas worked on that. I was like, OK, well, that mixed with a little bit of uh, Jedi Geki stuff from, you know, Hidden Fortress and such. You know, that's there were a lot of that. French sci fi uh, comic artists and, and writers that also get a lot of uh, uh, they were probably upset. Watching Star Wars, a lot of them. Uh, there oh, was a oh lot yeah, of, and in fact, to yeah. to tie it in with France, Phantom of the Paradise, while it's an American movie, very popular in France. Daft Punk cited it as a huge inspiration on the Interstellar four five movie. So there's your Matsumoto connection there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, very big in France. During the, do you want to talk about the production issues while the show was going? Because there was, of sure. course, the pre production issues, and then while the show was going, I know there's one episode where. It got delayed for a week because there was a baseball game. Uh, I I remember listening to the commentary track on the Macross DVDs and Matt Greenfield says that he brings up a production issue with Macross where he says, oh yeah, an episode got delayed because of a baseball game. And it was when I was watching Yamato that I found out he was talking about Yamato because I, in my head, I was always like, there's no, I can't find any source of a baseball game delaying Macross. (laughs) It was Yamato. Yamato got delayed by a baseball game. So there's probably that. another blessing there's losing to be honest. Yeah, they probably needed more time to work on that. The first eight episodes, they were still working under the guise that they would get the 39 episodes. And so they're building up this final arc that eventually they'll never get to deliver. Uh, Susumu Kodai finding the Yukikaze. I was kind of surprised that that gets taken out of the movie version. But I think that they it makes more sense when you... W- when they have to recontextualize uh, Mamoru's arc, and instead of becoming this Captain Harlock character who's traveling through space, he's this guy who crash landed on his Kandar. So of course, it's like, okay, we're going to move the Yukikaze. It didn't crash land on, I think it was Titan. Uh, okay. Didn't crash land near Jupiter. Instead, it, it went to Iskandar. The, the movie actually helps where they get to recontextualize a lot of the stuff that they were struggling with. Even, um, I felt like I was losing my mind when I started watching Yamato, and all the Gamalos have human skin uh <laughs> they have normal colored skin and i'm like i swear i've seen clips from this anime where they're blue why aren't they blue <laughs> i swear to god they were blue why is Dessler's a normal white man why the, he's supposed to be blue i swear every adaptation has to deal with this production change that around episode 11 they uh probably because the aliens didn't seem alien enough they decide okay um that's actually just the lighting, the way it hits them. Uh, but in this lighting, see, they turn blue and that's how they're actually blue, uh, yeah. which is I, I, I episode, my mind exploded when episode 11 happens and Destler's walking down the hallway and he's a normal white guy with blonde hair. And then he suddenly turns into blue. I'm like, oh, my God, it's a little it's a little disconcerting. I think that's an appropriate word for it. It's Matsumoto is plugging the holes of a ship desperately when it comes to this story uh, the entire way. He's managing the, con- you know, the engine room as it fills with you know, water. It's, it's a tough ship to manage, no doubt. Oh, yeah. And, and I can understand why they made these changes because me watching Yamato, there's a scene where Okita basically pulls up a monitor and he's talking with the, I, I don't know if it's like the prime minister, but it's, it's the head of Earth, basically. Mm-hmm. And... For a second, I was like, wait, is that a Gamalos? Because he looks like a Gamalos. Because the Gamalos just look like people. And it was kind of yeah. confusing. So once they make them blue, I understand why they needed to make them blue to, you know, obviously yeah. make them look like aliens. But yeah, let's let's get into the story more granularly now, because it kind of transfers us in production to story and what happened to the story of Yamato, where I think it's worth noting that the Yamato was originally just going to be a ship caked in a, a rock. It kind of looks like an old school, like iron, like an ironing iron, if you kind of... Yeah, like the Medico Mechanico this? factory from Fooly Cooly for my uh, millennial, yes. any millennial viewers. Perfect analogy. Yes. And who knows, maybe a reference. You, you really don't know. 
Matsumoto goes in and there's this very, you know, nationalistic story, this very, you know, sp Spokone feeling story trying to be told here, but they know it's not working. So he's got to let Matsumoto do something. So what, what does he really do to it? And for one, he draws what the Yamato looks like, which is the most important thing about it. It's, it's almost the most important thing about Yamato. I mean, am, am I wrong? Oh, no, absolutely. And that's uh, it's become such an iconic image of anime. And so many later anime owe their design philosophies to what was set there in Yamato. Yeah, it's beautifully drawn. And he really he draws all the characters too. he Dr. Dr. Sato, Dr. Sane is the only character he takes to completion in the process just because he wanted to do it. And he I honestly think Dr. Sato is one of the better uh, he understood how to transition his own style into an animated style. He probably just didn't have time to do it for every single character, which is a shame. I love Dr. Sato, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a character that I do know uh, how he was changed for Star Blazers because you can't have he's a uh, complete alcoholic, which is a running trend in Matsumoto stuff. I'm noticing the doctor who's an alcoholic. From what I understand in the Star Blazers version, he's addicted to spring water. They, they've got this great spring water from Earth, and it really brings on the nostalgia and the feels. So that's what's making them so emotional. It's the fact that it's okay. from Earth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Star Blazers covering up the lechery of IQ-9, the robot uh, analyzer. Uh, in other words, uh, IQ-9, some people say, is a better name for that character. Uh, I've heard and that those too. two I... are friends. I, I don't have an issue with Analyzer as, as a name. As a person, he's a bad person. What? Uh, <laughs> Canceled, yeah. Um, <laughs> Analyzer is definitely a, a, a bit of a lech. But it's it's really beautiful to see all the old uh, Matsumoto drawings. And I love the way that he draws Okita. He's my favorite character in Star Blazers. His, his Santa. He's got reference for, like, old military men. And... He really wants kids to feel that, I think. Oh, yeah. And one of my favorite things about Okita's design um, is that the man never takes off the hat. The hat's yeah. he in the in the anime, he goes in for freaking heart surgery or whatever. He's wearing the hat on the table. Uh, <laughs> he does it in 2199, but it, when he does, he just looks like fucking Santa Claus. He looks like anime Santa Claus when he takes oh. off his hat. <laughs> You know, Susumu and and uh, Daisuke, right? They they have this red and green motif. And Nishizaki, I guess, says to Matsumoto, hey, may, I want them to be, you know, these complementing colors. Let's make them red and green. But the, the standard at the time was always red and blue. And Matsumoto goes, are you colorblind? Do you, you know, he, and that's such a poignant, that's such a cutting insult. That just kind of goes to show like Matsumoto is this flippant young kid who says whatever the fuck he wants. And that's got to piss Nishizaki off every day of his life. Matsumoto's makes more sense considering uh, in Japan, there's always the comparison of the red Oni and the blue Oni. So you're mm. always supposed to contrast the red and the blue um, mm. in Japanese, even in uh, you'll see that in Gundam and and even other shows where they, you know, with with Gundam, you have the the Rambaral, who is the blue and the Shah Aznable, who's the red, you know, and you have like the hot tempered and then you have the calm collected fire and water are the kind of. Oh, yeah. Elemental. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or well, then in through Miyamoto, do we get Mario and Luigi? That's what I think. Exactly. That's what what was Nishizaki trying to say? I wonder then <laughs> red light, green light. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. He had his own sort of maybe it was earth and fire. I, I really don't know what he was about. I don't think he was a great storyteller. And I think that's why Matsumoto was there. <laughs> and the story is very aggressive. It's it's going out. It's launching out. It's it's fighting uh, an invasion of Earth. Uh, nuclear bombs, essentially planet bombs. Planet bombs are actually from another Matsumoto property called Ozma. Uh, lightning Ozma. So he takes that concept. They're they're raining the planet bombs on Earth, and that's you know we're getting a world. Obviously, the Yamato is a battleship from World War II. It's it's telling a story of post World War II devastation where Japan rises up to become the savior of the Earth. Am I too far off? 
Oh no, no, that's absolutely present. And again, that's that's Nishizaki uh, to a T. Even if he wasn't even a, intending it to be that way, you can feel mm-hmm. the DNA of those those young boy adventure stories. The you know the stories that are made to help recruit young young boys into the military. You can feel all of that in the especially in the very early stages of Yamato, especially those first three episodes. And beyond just the theme of you know becoming a soldier or becoming servicing your nation, servicing earth, obviously, but, you know, representing Japan well and rising above our, uh, you know, even though their entire military is now defunct uh, or replaced, at least bureaucratically and financially, he still wants that bravado in there. And, And it gets a bit dampened too by Matsumoto's kind of response to that he does. He's not unsympathetic to that story, but he dampens it. That's kind of what we see. What we see eventually happening with Mamoru Kodai feels way more like. I think that that's actually a better. Uh, I've always said that that's the ending where he's just on Starship's planet, even if it might come off as like a wet fart ending, where it's like, oh, he's just there. Um, mm-hmm. I prefer it over the Captain Harlock. I think it all because it also gives him a better arc than uh, being the guy who's. I'm always devoted to my nation. It it definitely it starts. It's definitely Matsumoto starting to imbue him more with that individualist notion that Matsumoto does. And it speaks to the sexual undercurrent of the Yamato story. Uh, we've 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 talked about a, a bit about this, and it's especially relevant. You don't see it so much so explicitly in the original, but in the remake, 2199, we'll start to touch on that here, uh, maybe pun intended. We've got we've got booties. We've got lots of booties on board in, in 2199. And you see clearly what the sexual themes already were. Well, with Yamato, what you see is it's funny because this is something that is pointed out in the liner notes for the show um, mm. is that in the first episode, you can see a mix of male and female character designs and you know, you don't think anything of it. Of course there's more male characters cause they're going for that shown in demographic, but there's women there. Um, Dr. Sato's assistant is a woman. There's uh, Yuki is there and there's other women who are dressed similarly to Yuki. In 2199 you're talking about. No, in the original. From oh, I didn't notice onward. that many women on board in the original. In, in from episode two onward, all the women are gone. Gotcha. They they redesign all the women to be male characters, and Doctor Sato's uh, assistant is redone to be a male character from then on. But there's a I feel animation. Yeah, there's a couple of animation errors where Doctor Sato's assistant still has the breast, but when you see the face, it's the male face. It's like they disappear, and they disappeared from my memory as well. So I'm glad you catch that. Um, well, and it's something that I was keeping in mind when I watched the compilation film, because I was wondering if they've reanimated scenes to sort of correct that issue. But I caught it. There's a scene in the compilation film where Dr. Sato's assistant has the breast on the outfit. But <laughs> then you see the face and it's the man face. That's still in well, the movie she, version. She is the mommy milkers of the Yamato story in 2199. I think you you <laughs> you saw that. and. She is, uh, even more so than, than Yuki, she's the most clear expression of, hey, let's get the birth rate up. <laughs> like, it, it, it didn't happen as badly in Japan, but it did happen. The birth rate was not going well. I feel like there's a bit of a story here. Hey, guys, why don't you go make more people? And Mamoru is a great expression of that. Um, he and Starsha, Starsha, at least in 29... Well, this might be 2022 20, spoilers, but uh, Dessler and Starsha definitely have an Oedipal thing going on. D- did you see that? Uh, Dessler, no. Uh, from, okay. from what I've seen of the movie uh, and the TV show, no, there's they, they don't. I mean, I don't even think they interact. In 2199, his fist and goes curses, but. <laughs> well, in 2199, the dialogue is very explicit. 
because it's about uh, creating our dream with Starsha. He alludes to that. And then 2022, they dive more into it. And I haven't seen the, you know, uh, the Bowler Wars or the Comet Empire uh, of the original Yamato, but I feel like they might get into these themes a little bit more in those. Uh, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen the Bowler Wars or the Comet Empire, so I'm in the same boat as you. <laughs> yeah. So what they dive more into in the reboots and what I think they might talk about more in those iterations is the relationship between Iskandar and Gamelon because they are rotating each other, right? They're intertwined. Yeah. And so we're seeing Dessler and and Iskandar is this wet water planet and it's got only women on it and it's a bit motherly in its kind of depiction. Uh, I, I don't know. So, so did you never get mommy vibes from Starsha? Oh, no, definitely from her. But I never uh, realized that there was a, a connection between, you know, Starsha and, and Dessler. So Starsha and Dessler do talk in the anime. They have a communication where they're like, this isn't cool what you're doing to the Terrans, right? Did you see that part in the original? Is that that's in 2199? No, that's in the original the Starsha's appearance in the original anime. You know how her face looks kind of goofy? <laughs> you know? Okay. Starsha's yeah. appearance in the anime. Yeah. So she talks that scene where her face looks so goofy is where she's communicating with Dessler. And they talk okay. to each other because they both know that the Terrans at that point are coming to Iskandar, but the humans don't know that Iskandar is right next to Gamelon. Their relationship, since they're so close, is if it's not Oedipal in the original anime, it's at least kind of like brother-sister vibes, right? They're, they're within each other's own family to, to an extent. And what the Earth is doing through Mamoru Kodai is... So we're, we're humans have left Earth, and the first thing we do is breed another species. Okay. And the Yamato well, is a tad that. phallic. <laughs> Just a I was bit. I was gonna say it is. Um I, I think 2199 did a did the right thing, adding more female characters. Um, mm -hmm. if only because you get those very awkward scenarios in original Yamato where they talk about repopulating the earth, and they mention mm -hmm. how, like, oh, the only people left might be the crew of the Yamato, which unfortunately is basically Loki saying that. Yuki, uh, you need to be the mother to every child, <laughs> essentially. And what would that create? Earth. What situation would that create, right? So it's yeah, exactly. it's saying don't go that way. Do not interbreed. <laughs> we we are we need to spread out. Uh, and maybe they're saying, hey, Japan, become <laughs> go forth into the rest of the world too. I, you know, you could take it there. And I don't know if Nishizaki's that far off in terms of the way he thinks. Yeah, that could definitely be the case. I mean, there's the Yamato TV show. Every episode had to have a conflict. It's very funny because in the compilation movie, the conflict, I think it's like episode 24 or 25. It's towards the end, but not the very last episode, right? There's a scene in the compilation movie where Yuki is talking to Starsha and there's this awkward cut due to them removing content where they go to the next scene and now Yuki's arm is in a sling. What happens is they cut out the conflict of that TV episode where the crew goes rogue and they want to start a new civilization on Iskandar and yeah. they kidnap Yuki to be the mother of their children. And on the Diamond Island. Yes, that's what it was, the Diamond Island. <laughs> yeah, not the most stable, uh, surprisingly unstable environment to, to create a new uh, Garden of Eden. And, and so these sexual themes are so prevalent in 2199. And the original Yamato, I think, definitely would have benefited, especially since it was going up against Heidi. Uh, yeah, we definitely need a lot more female representation on this boat that's about, it's the it's the Uchu love boat. Am I too far off on that? That's what, I mean, that's what Macross is. Night, Macross, Super Dimension Fortress Macross, 1982. The reason why it did incredibly well, and it's because... Macross hits those demographics where it has the space stuff for the boys, but there's so much of a romance angle for the girls that women were tuning in because they wanted to know, would Hikaru get with Minmei or would he go with Misa? What's going to happen mm -hmm. between Claudia and Roy? You know, And so having all those female characters who are all these 
uh, not just there for the love interest, but they're all characters that have agency. They all have these they're women in powerful positions and they have important roles in the story. Women wanted to see what happened with them. Yeah, Yuki wasn't, probably wasn't, you know, drawing enough alone. She was like a sole sexual object on the Yamato. And actually, a lot of people would say, oh, 2199's depictions are kind of objectifying, but they are sexual. That's for sure. Are they sexual objects? They have a fair amount of autonomy in 2199. Even if they're eye candy, does being eye candy make you an object? I don't know. We're get, I mean, that's a spicy theme to talk about, but thoughts? Yeah, yeah. And I, I honestly, uh, it, it, do, I would say no, just because even if they are, you know, it's the, it's the grand bayonetta debate of the internet from the 2010s, mm -hmm. where should, uh, I remember being online and all oh, the, the debates is bayonetta sexist because she's this incredibly sexy character, but she likes it. She likes the attention. She does it on purpose. Uh, yeah. She's totally like, she she has all this agency and all this and she's always in the one in power and in yamato the women are are you know they have agency they are in positions of power yamamoto who was redone as a female character in this which the reveal that that was yamamoto was very funny to me because i was like who's this who's this sexy girl that keeps showing up uh from accounting to to do fighter pilot stuff and then they, they reveal it's Mo yamamoto from the old series you know, she she she's a character with agency. She's much like those Macross girls. And uh, I would say the female character with the least agency would be uh, Yuria, uh, who is the pigtail girl that lets her hair down when she loses her agency. But she only loses her agency to a to a woman, another is an Iskandarian, but a, still a woman. So uh, there's no male domination of these women that I can see in 2199. Yuria also has the radio show which echoes uh, Maya, Maya show in Arcadia, My Youth. A lot of Matsumoto references oh, yeah, the, here. It, is it called like Arcadia Rose or Arcadia? I know it's based on Tokyo. It's called, Rose, uh, it's, it's called, the voice of free Arcadia, free at Arcadia, least in the okay. translation. Yeah, yeah. So, hey. <laughs> uh, but uh, maybe, I mean, and we talked about Makoto. She gives, she gets pregnant by the end of the thing uh, to, to the, I guess who ends up being a lecherous monk that's added to the cast. In 2199, they add all those female characters. And I, I did want to bring up that we're not just saying uh, they added booty because they added female characters. This show draws very detailed butts. I've, I was taking screenshots because I'm like, these are incredibly detailed butts. Because, I mean, you go from ya uh, Yamato 74, where it's not to be immature, but it's a sausage party out there. Uh, and then I noticed, I looked, looked it up. And all the merch is booty figs. It's all yeah. the female characters with big butts. <laughs> I've right. posted a lot of them, but they're not big enough to cover up what uh, Ice T, I believe, in an interview I saw with him called the Kill Zone. Uh, he, he this these are his words. The brothers like the booty because it's closer to the Kill Zone, and I think they're that's a very agitated way of referring to a, a, a vagina. I'm just going to call it a vagina. They are very highlighted. I think it's way more than booty because if it was just booty, the booty would cover that up, but it ain't just booty. It ain't just booty. It's beaver. And they're, that's because it's about reproduction guys. Get the birth rate up. That's what we're talking about here. So I don't want to dwell I mean, on that, that forever, it's, but it, it, I think, I think that show lines up with when Shinzo Abe first became prime minister. So that would make sense. Mm. Could this could have been a secret like uh underground producing by Shinzo Abe trying to get the birth rate up? No, and didn't didn't Nishizaki uh I, I believe Nishizaki spoke fluent English and didn't he like pitch Star Blazers? Isn't he like responsible for bringing it to the West? That would that would make sense, yeah. The the idea of this journey, it's also um according to Aritsune Toyota, who was one of Nishizaki's early writers he brought on to help make the series very much inspired by journey to the west like a lot of anime was but in star blazers they relate it more to uh, jason and the argonauts that's the whole the ship is called the argo okay well that that makes sense and that's like a perfect westernization uh go from a journey to the west reference to a jason and the argonauts reference i don't know which comes out first <laughs> what are the release dates on journey to the west and and jason and the argonauts story uh well, let's see well there's the ming dynasty and uh... <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't have those dates on, on lock. I should. It's pulling off of archetypes. This is a very, and Matsumoto does that. He's pulling from the, the origins of, of storytelling, where I think in a lot of anime, you're seeing people just, their childhood dreams just continue to manifest. They never stop having like these weird childlike ideas. You see, I think it's, a, you see it a lot in Ishinomori and, and Go Nagai works, where it's just that childlike imagination. Whereas I think Matsumoto is pulling from something a bit deeper in the history of storytelling. Oh yeah, with Matsumoto stuff, it's so romanticized. They always talk about the. Uh, I, I'm gonna drop them and then not know the names of them. But there's the like the four Chinese stories that are all like intrinsic to most Japanese storytelling, and Journey to the West is one of them. There's also uh, Sui Koden or uh, Water Margin, I think is what it's also called. Um, and there two other. They're also uh, Chinese. I, oh, uh, uh, what is it? Three Kingdoms. Those four stories are very intrinsic to a lot of Japanese creators where they start off. Yeah. Matsumoto has a unique advantage because his father is so in so linked to the French military, strangely enough, because the French sell their planes to the Japanese while they're industrializing before World War II. So that kind of bites them in the butt. But uh, Matsumoto is in like the top 1% of people in Japan at his time. Uh, uh, who have experienced European and Western culture. And he becomes a big fan of Wagner. I mean, he's got vinyl. He's listening to the classical romantic uh, musicians and he's hearing their stories. He's hearing the ring cycle. Oh yeah. And, and it's funny because Ishinomori got something very similar where oh. um, back then you actually couldn't, you couldn't leave Japan. It was, you couldn't just leave. Like uh, mm -hmm. it was uh, during the occupation era. Uh, Japan was closed off and regular citizens couldn't just say, oh, I want a ticket to, uh, to California and go. That was not allowed. Uh, Ishinomori actually traveled the world in the 60s because he was publishing stuff for a newspaper and he was able to get a pass as a uh, representative of the press. So because he was associated with the press, he was allowed to get a ticket to fly to America and actually flew to Europe as well and traveled the world. And that's why his stories became a lot more worldly. And with Cyborg 009 specifically, he cites that for why he wanted the team to be multicultural is because mm. he he likewise was one of those few people that in that time got to leave Japan and experience the West. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I wasn't so aware of that. So uh, he doesn't so much take on the the deeper storytelling heritage outside the world, but he just he just sees diversity in America. He he definitely has a, he understands America better probably than Leiji Matsumoto. Definitely. Leiji Matsumoto has never connected the way that Ishinomori's ripples kind of have, especially if we're going to talk about Power Rangers. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think we've done the story some justice. Uh, we wanted to talk about things that we didn't talk about B people. You, you were really, <laughs> you love that episode. It sounds Yeah. Like. I mean, if you want to talk about that, I, uh, you know, some people say it's the worst episode of Yamato. I don't say it's the worst because it's very memorable. It's at least mm -hmm. very memorable. And that that's for me, a bad episode is a boring, forgettable episode. Yeah. Um, but there is that episode. I believe it's episode 17. It opens with Analyzer doing his gag where Yuki's showing off a dress and, you know, talking about your themes of sexualization. I should have brought this up throughout the Yamato show. Yuki becomes more and more flirtatious with this crew being trapped on this crew of men, she starts walking around in these sexy clothes when she's not working. She just walks out in a see-through nightgown and she's like, oh, what's up, boys? What's going on? And so there's this episode, of, I believe it's episode 17, where she's like modeling a dress and she's like pretending she's a, a, a supermodel in the lunchroom. Analyzer flips up her skirt, which is his running gag. He's done it before. Yeah. Sonata and Kodai are then talking with Analyzer and they're like, oh, Analyzer, you're a crazy one, but you know, you need to be careful. Make sure you don't don't do any don't go too far with your 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 uh, flipping skirts and stuff. We've just been palling around here. Don't. But listen, don't. You know, there's a line. Yeah. Yeah. They basically tell him, like, hey, remember, there's a line. And, and Analyzer says, what if I want to cross that line? <laughs> and Kodai, Kodai's response is, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh... Analyzer, you wouldn't go go too far with things, would you? And he analyzer goes, maybe I would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's a very weird. Like, it's a 
very odd episode. And then, and, and we haven't even gotten to, they land on a planet of bee people and it feels like it, Yamato suddenly becomes a cheesy six, episode of 60 Star Trek uh, yeah. for an episode. Well, we could talk about Gene Roddenberry for sure. And the influence on Yamato, it's, it's, it's there. Are you much of a Star and, Trek buff? I'm mentioned. Not. I'm I'm not either, but I at least know that Studio Nui, who did the you know a lot of the z- design stuff for Yamato, they were huge Star Trek fans. Macross has I know for a fact Macross has tons of Star Trek references because Ishiguro and Shoji Kawamori and all those guys were big Star Trek fans. Um, they loved the idea of science based on you know more realistic science science that science fiction that was more sciency than it was fantasy, hard sci-fi right? more than yeah hard sci-fi really um so so star trek was definitely a huge influence yeah uh, but you don't uh, really see that in yamato uh, it's more uh it's not as obvious in yamato until you get to that episode where they're like now we're going to beam down to a planet and uh, there's these beer, beat pe- beat people and they're crushing people into mulch <laughs> i mean i think that the the dna of Star Trek has definitely got to Matsumoto and I think he he loved it and he integrated it, especially when we when it comes to talk about uh, the, the technicalities of a situation. You know, they get a bit of that in Yamato, the original anime. But it's if you read the manga at all, which I'll hold up here, it is. It is an explanation fest. I mean, Matsumoto is going to tell you every last drop of he's going to make it as quote unquote real as he can for you. And I think he does that because he also doesn't want to lose the the fantasy part of space opera in his work. So those two ideas are kind of reckoning there. I can definitely see that as someone who hasn't read the manga, of course, with the anime, anime always tends to lean more into the fantasy aspect while the more hard science fiction. And again, I'm using Ishinomori as a reference, but that was a common thing in his shows where he'd want his manga to be more hard sci-fi. Uh, but then for the anime, they'd be like, hey, people don't want to see science and math when they watch an anime. They want to see dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> They want to see big explosions. Yeah, whereas I think Matsumoto wanted both. He wanted he wanted it all, and he didn't want to lose the romantic part of all that old storytelling tradition. He wanted to keep that. I think he knew he couldn't if he stuck too hard to the science. Um, and Yamato doesn't do that so much, but they they like to explain things. That that bee people episode we haven't even talked about the bees yet. I mean, what do you think about the bees? What's so crazy about the bees? I I think there is some Matsumoto connection to it. Because I believe Matsumoto was a huge fan of the anime series Maya the Bee. So I can I can kind of see where they were going from, but they got um and me, I don't know, there's a lot of people who have worked in hentai that have also done regular industry stuff, but I did notice this episode was written by the writer of Urutsuki Doji, which might explain why Analyzer acts the way he does. But yeah, then they they go down to this planet of bee people where Analyzer and uh I keep wanting to call her K, uh, but Yuki <laughs> is uh, they're kidnapped by these bee people and kept as prisoners. And this isn't in the compilation movie. So this is, uh, I watched it a long time ago. Don't they want to grind them into mulch and then use that to for their... Is, Maybe. Is, is, I know that they are, they're doing a lot for the Garmalas empire, right? They're, they've been enslaved by the Garmalas, like every other civilization in the universe, apparently. So... Uh, I don't think, I don't know if they say that explicitly in Star Blazers, which is what I watched. So you'll, you'd have to fill me more in on the, in the Japanese version, but mulching up, uh, I'm that. curious, how does the, um, how does Star Blazers skip that episode? Well, like, I'm no. curious because the inciting incident, the inciting incident is something that they had to cut. I'm sure with the flipping skirt, cause I know they cut out the skirt flipping scenes. It's, it's cut around more so, but yes, uh. They don't they don't show that. I think they do still kind of allude to it happening a bit in Star Blazers. What I know about the bee people in Star Blazers is that they are, you know, submissive to the Garmalons and but then they have their own uprising happening. So they're kind of like dealing with a prisoner revolt on their own planet. And then the Garmalons show up and Yamato shows up and it's a cluster that uh, of of like everybody losing except for the Yamato. So they, they don't have that awkward conversation with Analyzer or IQ9, I guess I should say. Yes, yes. So that does happen. The the robot has the ability to love, but it's very sentimental in Star Blazers. It's very much like, 
oh, it's okay. IQ9, are you alone in the world? Oh, and it ends sentimentally for me. It looked like it did in Japanese too, but you get a different vibe off it. I, I get it. I mean, the, uh, I've sent you screenshots of the exact conversation happening. Yuki goes to Captain Okita and it's basically like her going to HR and being like, yeah, you got to do something with this robot. Uh, <laughs> he's he's being really inappropriate. And Captain Okita is like, uh, he's like, there's nothing I can. He's a robot. There's what you want me to do. <laughs> it's a little more like cerebral in Star Blazers. They, they take it from a very like Star Trek angle, which is maybe why I see more of the Star Trek in Star in the original Yamato. Maybe that that was the reference for the localizers a lot of the time. And they're playing into this concept of IQ9's AI kind of developing emotion, like love feelings. And that's why he's so, quote unquote, flirtatious. That seems a lot more meaningful than uh, what we got in Japanese. In Japanese, it seems like they were like, uh, like, oh, we need we need they they kind of just like, oh, we need to hit a little fan service quota just to get that in there because we we think we might scare some people with the sci fi. So let's throw in yeah. something for the fans there. Well, Matsumoto wasn't definitely wasn't against sexy in his in his property. Oh, no, he he made his uh, he broke through in the manga world with his story, Otako Oiden, which is rife with it is a it's a more children's version of that manga. The previous version was much raunchier and had a lot more nudity and it was an adult manga. And he makes a child version of that and it becomes super, super freaking popular. So uh, there's always a, some sex in Matsumoto's work. It, it he, he wasn't he wasn't against the gags. We'll say that. Oh, yeah. Well, that that reminds me of with the Shinomori when uh, it seemed like probably around 72, maybe 73, 74, he suddenly became incredibly horny. Uh, and it's funny because you look at his 60s stuff. It's nothing that pushes the boundary. It's no he's no gonna guy when it comes to that stuff. Uh, but then in the 70s, he suddenly he just goes, well, gonna guys doing it. Uh, I'm not I'm not raunchier than him. I'm not any raunchier than him. And he just starts doing a lot more, a lot more nudity, a lot more panty shots, a lot more stuff like that. There's a, a great screenshot I use from the Inazuman manga, uh, the main character. He's looking at his uh, childhood friend and he's he's like kind of flirting with her. And uh, she says, like, don't look at me with those horny eyes. And he says, do I have horny eyes? And he looks at himself in the mirror and he has like a really horny face on his. <laughs> on, uh, I think that's a great screenshot. But that was around 72, and you started seeing a lot more manga authors, probably influenced by going to guy, do willing more willing to do stuff like that. Well, the way we were talking about it earlier, definitely could have been a Japanese psyop. There's no <laughs> there's I, I don't see that being impossible for sure. Uh oh yeah. <laughs> they, go ahead, make it sexy. And every mangaka in Japan was like, uh, okay, that's not a problem. Any any other story points you wanted to talk about? Well, yeah, um, I thought the story for me, it really picked up uh, after those eight episodes and they know they when they're when they know they're getting cut down to 26, they really start to laser focus their ideas, which I think helps the show, actually, because um, now they're like, OK, we know we, we, we're no more putzing around. We're, we're doing this. Once they introduce the character of Domo, which is a character I'm surprised mm -hmm. I haven't brought up, probably my favorite, uh, one of my favorite characters in the in the whole show um domo the space wolf i'm not sure what they call him in star blazers but through him you get an idea of the characterization of the gamalas where you fall, you start to realize like okay this is a race that's so powerful that they kind of don't want to see the yamato as a threat because they can't imagine that they're that they themselves could possibly lose right yeah. and domo is a character who's like a very serious military professional really and he's like you need to take this seriously we can't allow this to happen you're not uh he goes in there's a scene in the show where he goes in and he sees a bunch of gamalas who are just they're drinking space basically space alcohol uh and he just starts like he takes out a riding crop and starts beating them <laughs> he's like he's yeah. like this is why we haven't beaten the yamato yet i, I love a lot of Domo stuff because uh, my favorite Gundam villain is definitely Ramba Rall, who is very similar to Domo. I would say Domo is probably the prototype for Ramba Rall. He's this blue Oni. He's the one who's more calm and collected. He's the one who takes things more seriously. Whereas you have the Shar Aznable, who's more hot-headed and more individualistic. He's more, 
I'm going for what I want and I'm going to destroy the white base because it's in my path where Ramba Rawl has a clear goal and he also has this respect for his own men. Um, he's not just throwing men at, at them to, to throwing them until they, they do damage. He's, he has this respect for his men that his men also in turn respect him. He's this very professional character. So that's why I think Domal is such an interesting character to me. And you can even see some, like I said, with Gundam, where Domal's final attack is this kamikaze. If you've ever seen original Gundam, that is what Ramba Rall does, where he basically says, we have nothing more we can do, but charge them head on and do as much damage as we can. And he basically says, man, are you in this with me? And they all, because they respect him so much, they all say, we're in this with you. And they do this final assault on the white base in uh, Gundam, where they basically do a kamikaze and they just do a run and gun of taking out anyone they can. And that's a lot like what Domal does at the end where he kamikazes the Yamato and he goes down with his ship. And he even has that moment with Okita where he's like basically shares respect because he also sees Okita as this person. That's like, you're, 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 you're the same kind of man as me. And we're both fighting for what we're going to do. And we're both going to put our lives on the line. And one of us at the end is going to die. Yeah. Domo definitely does a great job of, a uh, better job, uh, necessarily better job than Dessler of humanizing the enemy and humanizing the other soldiers. And this is something that Matsumoto will do through the rest of his career. He wants to paint specifically the Axis forces, uh, the soldiers as human, uh, separate almost from the conflict itself, because their honor isn't necessarily the same expression as the war itself. It's an individual's expression within that war as a warrior. <laughs> it's really important because Dessler can't do it as much, but he still does it. He gives Okita props too. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the, one of, uh, as far as early scenes with Dessler, that's one of the most telling of his character is when he, he asked the name of the captain of the ship. And there's even the scene where the one uh, Gamalos guy kind of insults them and Dessler like hits a trap door and drops him. And he's like, I don't need people to talk that talk like that in my in my court. Well, can we talk about fat representation in Liege Matsumoto? Uh, his, oh, yeah. His, yeah. His, finally. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a big I'm a big dude. This isn't a skinny frame. OK, I'm not going to show off the whole thing right now, but I, I, I see it and I notice it very frequently and it goes back to the uh the diamond island uh sort of capture of yuki as well uh which is led by one a not a skinny character there's kind of there's like some moral depravity uh that that has to be punished by fat people in these in these stories did you notice that i didn't think i didn't think that was the case just because i think there's also fat characters who are good guys like you think look at um tokugawa and you know who's like the old the oldest guy on well, the ship older Probably people get a pass older people get a pass okay. because they can't because there's food and and they're old you know i feel like yeah there's a lot of reference for older bigger dudes for sure but the young bigger dudes they're the it's the most morally deprived character in the show on the yamato is the biggest youngest character does that make sense no i get you and i, I forget his name his, he has a name that's like zawa or something um mm -hmm. uh but yeah orange orange jumpsuit uh it seems like all the orange guys are fat too if if i'm remembering right yeah I don't know if that's yeah that, that color denotes denotes because uh in Star the, Trek, there's the colored shirts that denote what what right. section you're in in yamato right. it seems a bit more vague but orange is the fat color yeah for sure uh in in 2199 sukaje is kind of leading this effort to, they don't want to capture Yuki and repopulate the earth. They want to, they find another planet that is wet. And so it's kind of like an Iskandar planet and they want to stop the Yamato there before they reach Iskandar and repopulate the earth. And that's the, I'm starting to spoil 2199 for you. Kearu Niimi. Yeah, the yeah, one she, that, uh, now I only watched 10 episodes. But uh, yes, I do remember because I remember she has the line where she goes, you act so robotic. And I'm like, are they going to reveal his robot body? They kind of I don't know if they do in that version. But what I know is that uh, she ends up kind of exacerbating the divide between Daisuke and Susumu because they make Daisuke kind of almost leads this effort 
to to kind of re- mutiny and uh there's some death and there's a lot of cops on the yamato there's like a so you know how the yamato in the original like they are acting against orders kind of they're just kind of willy-nilly they they kind of throw the order of military drama to the wind sometimes do you get that vibe in the original at all absolutely because there are times where they're like okay susan mukodai you're our commanding officer and i'm like is sonata not right there shouldn't sonata be the commanding officer now yeah it's it's a little loosey-goosey and so they they have like a security force on the yamato that acts as cops during this rebellion and they're crooked cops basically and the the cast the ensemble crew is so much better in the reboot just infinitely better probably because they you know and the pacing's great and they give every character great growth in 2199 it's just we could maybe talk about that i mean the difference there in the reboot and what they do with it is really potent, but doesn't insult me. Some people does, but... Well, the first thing with the reboot that I noticed is that, and clearly it's made for a Japanese audience because it's... Uh, I had first got hints that this is made for an audience that knows Yamato and has expectations. And even in just those first 10 episodes, it's, oh, it's playing with your expectations for for sure. Um, one of those obviously being the gender swap for Yamamoto, um, but also the white skinned Gamalos. It's not just the light, the way the light hits them. They reveal that those are actually like other races that were brought into the Gamalos empire. And so yeah. Gans and Schultz are, are essentially the second class citizens of the Gamalos empire. Yeah, it does a really great job of fleshing out the empirical nature of the Gamalas and what their plan is. And like I said, it, it has much more of an Oedipal vibe because Dessler is talking about our great plan for the universe. And that's a really important thing to him. But they don't really talk to you about what exactly who's our. You kind of get the implication because if you probably especially for people who've seen all the old Yamato, they kind of know. So they, I think they bring some of the stuff that happens in later movements of Yamato into 2199. Uh, I'm, I'm totally good with you spoiling. I, I told you that I was watching episode 10 and I was uh, watching it in bed and I actually sort of uh, fell asleep watching it. But the last thing I remember is uh, the one Gamalas woman. She's uh, talking with Susumu Kodai and she basically says, you're at part responsible for starting this war as well. And me only knowing original Yamato, I'm like, you're crazy lady. You were <laughs> dropping bombs from Pluto this whole time. I'd like to know how earth is responsible. So I'm curious. You said that they actually do go into that more. Yeah. I'm curious in 2199. What, how is earth also responsible? So I guess we'll, we'll throw on official spoiler warnings at this point. It turns out that during first contact, uh, Han shot first. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, okay. So the Gamalos went to earth probably with the intention of going, Hey buddies, we could use yeah. some water. Our, uh, our planet's a uh, kind of a volcano waiting to erupt. Uh, and earth <laughs> something said, like that back the fuck off. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> now, I don't even think they said anything. I think it was a preemptive attack and Okita is actually on board. And so, uh, Daisuke's father was on this ship too, and he died. And before he left, he tells Daisuke, we, we can make peace with the aliens. And he has to die knowing that that's not what they did. Okita like disobeys orders. It's a, it's a whole thing. They do kind of, okay, so we, this could play into talking about what, what do they do? What do the old school fans think is so feminizing? And this is the word that I hear all the time by old, old school fans of Star Blazers, you know, boomer energy, whatever you want to call it. They, they don't like the art style for one. Okay. Do you feel this is a highly feminine? They, I hear Moe. Moe has said a lot about this art style. It is, but that isn't something that is new to Yamato though, because mm. even I haven't now granted, I haven't watched the Comet Empire of the Bowler Wars, but by Yamato three, by the, if you watch, I've seen the opening to the Bowler War, Susumu Kodai is looking like Tuxedo Mask over there. <laughs> you know, uh, they, they've already started moifying these characters, even in the eighties, seeing those character designs for the 2013 show, they are moified. Um, th- definitely the male characters uh, have that, 2010s anime look to them at the same time i don't think it is uh, i don't think it goes against 
the tone that the show is setting. I don't think it's uh, diametrically opposed to the story at all. I also think they protect the male noses a lot. Like, you're not getting every nose is the same in the male characters. You get it with some of them, but not all of them. You know what? I, I forget his name. You probably know it. The character designer, Nobutero Yuki, he is known for his noses. If anyone has seen Escaflone, the schnozzes on those folks, uh, it's it's crazy. Did you call it Escaflones? Ex- I, I mean, I... I don't know if that that sounds intentional. I think that's what they were going for. I think so too. Nasal steroids. Um, anyways, so as far as like feminizing, I and there's a lot more female characters. So if you were to say the storyline was feminized, part of that might be uh, okay. For one thing, the 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 wave motion gun, which we've hardly talked about, which is strange. The wave motion gun is like the biggest draw. Uh, that's the attack, right? You have the Yamato, but it's got to have an accompanying attack. The wave motion gun is what makes Yamato so freaking cool. And by the end of 2199, they've blocked it up. And they said, we won't use this anymore to the Iskandars. So that that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. And whereas in the original anime, they're just, they're using that thing. Hey, we got, let it rip. Do you know much about this? Well, it's funny because uh, it's surprising we haven't mentioned the wave motion gun because it's such an iconic anime thing. Even people who haven't seen Yamato, the influence of the wave motion gun can even be seen in the Kamehameha from Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Like, uh, the I mean, the name in Japanese is Hado. Uh, it's the Hado gun, right? That's where the Hado Ken from Street Fighter comes from. It's named for uh, Space Battleship Yamato. So this idea of anime characters shooting beams... Well, you know, of course, Ultraman is an inspiration with the the Specium beam. Yamato is also, I think, a big, uh, a big component of of anime characters shooting these blasts at each other. Right in the seventies anime, they at least towards the end they say like, "Well, it uses too much energy," so it's like that's why they can't just keep shooting, keep shooting Hado beams. Uh, right. To find out that they actually just plug it up and say like, "What is it for ethical reasons that they decide?" Yeah, uh, basically. Uh, yes. Yeah. So wave motion gun goes against the Geneva Convention. Exactly. Uh, yeah. They're like, we gave you this technology not to do this. You did exactly. And they say in 2199, you did what the Gamalas did. And they admit that they were the first ones to use wave motion technology to start obliterating worlds and taking over. Whereas in the original Yamato, the Iskandarians all die off because of an illness in Star Blazers. Is that how it is in Japanese? It is, but I think it's much. It seems like they made it much more clear because I, when I watched the uh, the film compilation, you know, after uh, they defeat the Gamalas Empire, there's the scene of Susumu Kodai and um, and Yuki, and Yuki's crying, and she says, "Knowing we've wiped out this civilization, I don't think I could ever face God. I don't think I can ever be forgiven." Yeah. And Susumu says, "A victory is supposed to feel good." Uh, this victory, all I taste is ash, yeah. Uh, which I thought was a very powerful line. But in my head, I'm thinking, you know, these guys were dropping planet bombs on you. I don't, I, you know, I, it's for me. I was like, well, the Gamos, they fucked around, and then they found out. You know, it's the, it's the graph. <laughs> you fuck around. Well, you sound a bit like Mishizaki. Out, right? <laughs> that's that's that may um, be the uh, Matsumoto's kind of dampening that. That already marks yeah. a more feminine approach. It's a more compassionate approach, if anything. So, oh, yeah, for sure. It's it's interesting there to say, okay, well, it's been so feminized. But I think what they're also doing is making it more clear that the Iskandarians, the fem- most feminine force in Yamato, a strictly female planet uh, that kind of mothers Garmalos, they're not, they're a bit all consuming they're testing the yamato oh but what have they done starsha's having all this moral dilemma and then mamaru's not physically there at the end uh mamaru dies and loses but his soul is turns out to be the cosmo dna and she's looking at his soul and talking to it before she tans it over and she's like but i'm gonna lose you and this is the all-consuming mother this is the mother who refuses to let go of the son and and consumes him instead and she's battling that too starsha is not a perfect feminine 
goddess to be, you know, she's got a dark side. And and I'm perfectly fine with spoilers. So uh so that's how 2199 ends. I uh yeah. I kind of I kind of like that cuz with the Cosmo DNA, you know, you also get um it also makes the battleship Yamato itself an important aspect. The sort of it literally makes the Yamato ship a key to saving the earth. And it saves more than the earth. And the Cosmo reverse does more. We've talked about this before. The Cosmo, the reason the Yamato, they explained 2199, has to go to Iskandar to, to do the Cosmo re reverse because they ask like, well, why didn't you just send us the Cosmo reverse? Well, what they have to do is bring the Yamato to Iskandar as so that it's, so that the memories of the earth through the materials that create the Yamato can imbue the Cosmo DNA. And then now having Mamoru's soul, maybe that should have taken care of it, but what, whatever, I don't care about that. What I care about is there's the ancestral DNA, which is a huge part of Leiji Matsumoto's work. He's, he's always talking about this. You, you pointed out in the manga that uh, who, who is the officer that, that makes a cameo? In Hajime this? Saito. Who is? Uh, he was the leader of the Shinsengumi, who, uh, which was a group that fought against the Meiji government during the Meiji restoration of Japan. And this is, you know, the ancestral DNA of, of this character, Hajime. Uh, what was it? Yeah, Hajime. Who, Hajime is the name of uh, a later Leiji Matsumoto protagonist in Queen Melania. He's existing in the universe again. And that's what it, the Cosmo DNA does. It revitalizes the DNA. It brings back the DNA of time, the intersection of DNA and time back to a certain point. And Mamoru does that, okay? And that's what the Cosmo DNA does. And I will leave one thing unspoiled for you from it, okay? So I'm not gonna talk about what all the Cosmo DNA does in 2199. I will talk about the very ending of the original Yamato, which is just, well, it's a little different in the anime and the movie. Do you remember the differences in the, in the very ending of those two? Oh yeah, there's a whole epilogue with, uh, as it, uh, what's, what's the line from that Star Wars movie? Uh, uh, somehow Palpatine has returned. Somehow Dressler uh, has returned. And there's a, a whole epilogue battle where he attacks the Yamato. And uh, I guess I, I, I might spoil original Yamato here, but the, where Yuki basically dies and then comes back. All of that is is removed from the movie. Uh, once they get to Iskandar, it's it's smooth sailing from there in the movie version. But in the movie version, that's two and a half hours into the movie. You don't really have time to do another little arc fighting Dressler. Yeah, and there's also at the end of the movie, they show the Earth returning to life. Do you remember those those like screenshots of the Earth kind of bluifying at the end credits I, of the movie? Does that happen? I do. I do. And that's that's actually one of the things that I, I watched and noticed and thought, oh, that's like a Gunbuster homage is at the, at the end of Gunbuster. There's a scene okay. of Noriko looking at the Earth and it's completely pitch black because she's if if you haven't seen it, she gets shot like ten thousand years into the future, and and she sees the Earth and it's pitch black, and she go she's looking at it and she's contemplating and she's saying, has human has humanity died out? Have I really gone so far that humanity lost the war and there's no more life on Earth? Am I the last living being? And then lights start to appear that say welcome back home or welcome home, indicating that. Earth had been waiting for her to come back this whole time, and they waited until the exact time so that they could send her this message by lighting up lights across the Earth. And it's it seems like that was clearly inspired by the end of the Yamato film of the, the Earth turning from this, like, wasteland, this scabby-looking wasteland, to just the crossfade into the beautiful blue Earth. Australia really looks like a, an oddly shaped scab. It, it always sticks out to me in the Yamato rendition of Earth, like as a dried up red ball. And you don't get that like more hopeful uh, display of the Earth returning in either anime 2199 or the original, which I thought was weird. But the I do prefer the ending of the original anime uh, because it spends so much time with Okita in his last moments. And I was telling you before, like Okita, I think he's kind of the main character. He opens the show, he closes the show. And Okita passing just makes me tear up. And it doesn't do it as much in the movie, but I like seeing the earth return. But then in 2199, it doesn't end on Okita. It ends with Susumu and Yuki. And there they say the last thing. And I think just that little subtle change 
it dampens Okita's death, but it I cried again for totally different reasons. I didn't I cried because it was hopeful at the end of 2199. I cried because it was bittersweet at the end of the original Yamato. But. I can see that. And and also I'm I, you know, I'm desperately trying to pull it up right now. Um, but at the end of the uh, TV series, there's a line and I want to get the quote exactly right, because I thought it was very powerful, but very like pessim- almost pessimistic sort of on September 5th, the earth was uh, restored to its normal color. But to the rest of the universe, it was as if nothing had happened. That's in the anime, not the movie. The movie seems very optimistic, but I'll, yeah. I'm going to see if I can pull that up right now. I'm going to just so I can get that quote. If you have anything you want to mention, go ahead. Uh, no, I mean, I think it is. It's. Hope is very understated at the end of Yamato. It doesn't end with, it ends with kind of the ship going into, you know, the earth and just who knows what happens next. And maybe they were hoping they could, you know, maybe they didn't want to blow their load. Maybe they were holding out. Maybe something different would happen. And something different did happen. Several years later, they got to make the movie, which has a much more optimistic ending but it also kind of stands on its own has to i mean this is i will say yuki does have a death and brought back by cosmo dna and it, but it's very different but i like that in 2199 it ends on her resurrection her hope with susumu and yuki they take over as main characters moving forward with yamato and it's it's a beautiful transition there it's a little it's a little more open ended with the anime and the movie even. Gotcha. And I did pull up. It's actually uh it's interesting because it's done like a news uh update across the uh, where it runs across the bottom of the screen and it says uh on September 6th, 2200, the Yamato returned to Earth. Space was calm as if nothing had happened. It it could almost be seen maybe it's a commentary on all the work they had just done <laughs> feeling a bit I mean, maybe they were feeling bittersweet by the end of it, right? It'd been such a hard thing to do. I'm sure Matsumoto was proud of the work that he did in spite of the problems that he was aware of. And it was that bittersweetness at the end of the original anime. You're feeling what the studio was probably feeling too. Yeah, that's uh, you can see a lot of the parallels to the Yamato production in the show. I mean, even with the epilogue is like, here's our, here's our final hurrah. It's the right. the last uh, attack of Dressler. This is our this is our last attack essentially, and it's funny because that uh, that Dressler epilogue is actually they reuse that in Yamato in Yamato in Macross, which also again directed by Noboru Ishiguro. He has this villain Kamjin who is is similar to Dressler. He's a bit more of a pretty boy type than Dressler is. But after they defeat the main uh, Zentradi fleet, there's a an arc called the Reconstruction Arc that's mostly slice of life stuff the characters you know reacclimating to earth after uh the war but Kamjin is like this last survivor who's on earth and he's planning a counterattack and that last uh attack is very similar to Dressler's it's, it's kind of a combination of Dressler's attack in Yamato and Garmazabi's attack on the white base in uh in Gundam but that it, it was funny watching Yamato and catching all those Macross seeing what all those Macross homages uh 10 years earlier or so yeah, there's so much. I mean, original Yamato is not for me. It was not the easiest thing to get through in a lot of spots. It, like you said, it is really formative. It's it's such a huge link in the DNA of anime itself that you owe it to yourself to kind of see why it was it was so important. And and you don't lose anything. I think if you watch the reboot first, even you might you might respect the original anime a lot more if you watch the reboot first, cause that was my experience. Really? Cause I, I, I think, I don't know how I would feel. Um, cause I think that, like I said, with the reboot from what I saw again, only 10 episodes, but it feels like it plays with, it expects you to know Yamato so that it can play with your expectations. So I will say, I do think you get a little more out of it watching the old one first, but that's just me. I liked, I like, cause I watched the the reboot, then I watched the original, then I just watched the reboot again. And I got to have both experiences. So I think I might've won out there even. I think that the reboot for people who aren't familiar with it. Okay, here's here's what you won't see. You won't see it. You won't see a, a, what's his name? A circus. You won't see a missile circus coming out of any of these fighter ships, uh, which I think might throw some people off. Oh, and a, ta- a Tano circus. Atano, yes. 
Yes, you will not see a missile circus. And you'll see, I think when you see these ships coming out of the Yamato, a lot of younger kids might be like, when they fire out two missiles and you hear donk, and it's not like one giant explosion for, and you know, hyper ADD movement constantly, you might be a little surprised by that. I mean, we could talk about the remakes 3D too, but what, what did you think about that? I mean, how do you feel about the Itano Circus and what, what modern dogfighting in anime became versus what Yamato was doing in the realistic, more hard sci-fi angle of it? Mac well, Ross what is I, where- I posted one time in your Discord, with- I called it a symphony of all the crazy like m- missile things that were happening. There were missiles that were exploding into like gaseous arms and different missiles would explode if they touched those arms. But it's not like an Atano circus where you see all of them going like a million missiles all at once and just this hyper ADD thing. Whereas Yamato and even in the remake, they respect the more subdued stuff, but it's still it's more of a symphony than a circus. My, here's my thing. Uh, I, and I always tell people, this is just my preference. I'm allowed to have my preference. I am yeah. a I am a 3D and a CG hater. I am a yeah. certified hater. Um, granted, all anime nowadays use CG and 3D. There's no escaping mm-hmm. that, which is why I tend to, I prefer older series. You'll notice that with me. If, the, if I'm watching an old series and a new one, I'll usually gravitate towards the old one because I'm a CG hater. Oh, ever since I was a kid and I saw Pokemon the movie 2000 and that guy's <laughs> airship was CG, I said, I can't do this. Um, <laughs> hey, y'all, John retracted his hatred of 2199's 3D, but I wanted to leave in the discussion we had because I think his arguments will still resonate with a lot of people. Granted, there's plenty of anime I like that use a lot of CG, but I like the story, I like the characters, and I can, you know, I don't like that aspect, but there's other aspects I like. And the Yamato remake seems to be in that camp of, yeah, you're not going to get those hand-drawn spaceships and battles that you know, really draw me into anime, but you got the characters and you got a lot more, a lot deeper story. So I think it's worth it. I think it's a worthwhile trade-off. So, so you think it's not, it's not a treat. You don't, I kind of see the 3d as a, I think it's a treat. I think I like how they did it too, because you still have hand drawn lines all, all over everything, but there's a model underneath being doing all the coloring work. You know, they did that on Gundam, the origin too, uh, which also has CG mechs. And I, I give it credit because I think it looks better than a lot of regular TV anime, especially. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why you don't see a lot of TV anime doing mecha anymore because it, it requires so much CG work now. And Gundam, the origin, they definitely had their A team working on that. But I am a, I am a bona fide hater. Uh, I am a <laughs> hater to the core. <laughs> there'll be there'll be no budging on this topic for you. I, that's okay. That's okay. You're it, it, it didn't repulse you, so I think that is no. a testament of its quality in and of itself. Uh, I liked it. I and I like how the battles play out. That they're not super hyper. I like that the the new one. You follow the battles, and there are fi- there's physics to to how things work instead of it just being. Everything is breaking gravitation. Instead of it just being those uh, those new Evangelion movies, right? That sounds that sounds right. That sounds <laughs> Th- right. Yeah. Throwing, I'm just I'm throwing a little shade. I think it's fair shade to be thrown. Um, and and we could talk about Ano and his relationship to. I mean, we could talk about influence real quick too. Just I mean, you know, I think you know a lot about that. It's funny because the way I watched an, the the anime was. I had basically seen everything that was hugely inspired by Yamato before Yamato, because I I'd obviously seen Gundam. Uh, I'd seen Macross, which Macross started essentially as a uh, I'm not going to go into the whole history of Macross, but it, event- it basically started as a parody of Gundam that and that was how they pitched it. But obviously it was also parodying Yamato a lot, too. And when the series in production shifted to be a more serious show, it kept a lot of those Gundam and, of course, Yamato elements to it. You know, the opening, the first episode of Macross is titled Booby Trap, where the Macross ship on activation opens and it splits apart its center and shoots a massive beam into outer space. And it's literally just the the way that's the wave motion gun, essentially. You know, Captain Okita's outfit is clearly the inspiration for Captain Global's outfit. Susumu Kodai was clearly an inspiration for Hikaru Ichijo. In Robotech, he calls it, he calls Roy Fokker his big brother. 
Um, in Japanese, he calls him his senpai. But it is supposed to be a big brother relationship. It's very much mm-hmm. like Susumu and Mamoru. There's, there's, uh, I, I mean, shots. The opening shot of the city being destroyed is straight up the city being destroyed in Yamato as well. Even um, the Zentradi clearly very influenced by the Gamelos. I, I made a, I made a short video about this, but no one seemed to care. Uh, it's one of those things that it seems like only I cared about where, um, because, you know, the Gamelos in Yamato, they, they don't call the planets by their names because they don't know the Earth names for them. They just yeah. say, like, the fifth planet, the seventh planet. Uh, in, in Yamato, there's this element of they have the tenth planet that was beyond Pluto. Uh, I think it's called Minerva, and it was destroyed, actually, by the Gamelos. And that's something that's actually low-key integrated into Macross, where there's, like, a little Easter egg where they the Zentradi acknowledge a tenth planet. The subs corrected it because they thought it was an error. But no, that was actually a, a, a reference to Yamato. And and it just kind of went over a lot of people's heads. I think there's some scientific basis for that, that w- at least at the time that Yamato was created, that Matsumoto might have been referencing himself, right? Yeah, yeah. That was actually a very common sci-fi plot point at the in the 70s was, what if there's a 10th planet? Um, and and Matsumoto brings it up in a lot of other works as well. I believe Dangard Ace also has a uh, a tenth planet in its uh, solar system as as a plot point. And there's a lot about Yamato that ends up on the cutting room floor that ends up in his future stuff too. Uh, stuff that didn't make it into the anime that was in the uh, manga, which I would say the manga is closer to Matsumoto's original story treatment for Yamato. And uh, we see in the spot in uh, Yamato where they're in this trap up against a sun and a gas cloud that, you know, they've got to choose which way they're going to go. Uh, it ends up that interdimensional space they're in is a spaceship graveyard. And if you've watched uh, Endless Orbit SSX, which is off of the Arcadia My Youth movie, the story about Captain Harlock, they are in a spaceship graveyard where they have a battle with the Illumidos. Uh, so bits and pieces of this will end up in other Matsumoto stuff as well. Obviously, we talked about Captain Harlock. It was really important that Captain Harlock wasn't in the anime. Um, so there, there was even more stuff like that that just ended up in Matsumoto's later works. And, and I actually love that with the Zentradi, something they do. One of my favorite things about Macross, because Macross just like defies a lot of your expectations for what a war story will be, is that there's a point where the Zentradi basically, there's a, a, actually a section, of the, a section of the Zentradi that say, hey, let's negotiate with these humans. We can, let's just end this war. And there are some Zentradi that are like, oh, no, 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 no. We need to finish this war. But a huge portion of them, including Britai and Exodol, who are considered the main villains up until that point, say, no, let's let's talk this out. Let's, you know, let's meet uh, on, on solid ground with them. And it's something that just like completely subverts your expectations. And I feel like that's something that they could have maybe explored in Yamato. Maybe they wanted to mm-hmm. where, and they do in the 2199, it seems like they do where there's like, yeah, yeah we're, we're getting screwed over a little bit by this too. Well, they definitely do in the, in, you know, Comet Empire and Bo- uh, Bowler Wars as well. Dessler gets expanded on the Garmalas don't disappear from the Yamato storyline. It's definitely there. They want you to feel like this is an actual conflict between similar life forms and not just monster versus humanity, which it ha- that was what anime was before this, from what I understand. Before this, and even for a little while after this, Gundam is is credited for being one of those first anime where it was uh it was this space battle, but both sides were humans. You know, there's there's no alien, there's no oh, I'm clearly I, I see more of myself in in the good guy side. It's like these are yeah. two factions of humans, but Yamato starts it off where they're they may be aliens, but they're humanized. You know, it's not like it's not like in Guy King where you have a, a crew of aliens that are all horned monsters that are clearly uh, evil, you yeah. know, Oni. or, or yeah. Mazinger where you have doctor. The, the villain's name is Dr. Hell. So he's yeah. clearly the bad guy in this situation. Yeah. Uh, but Dessler is a bit uh, Himmler or Hitler, right? That's obviously they're German uh, forces. They're trying to give you that look in World War II. What I think is funny about between the Japanese version of Dessler and Deslock, which is the name in Star Blazers, maybe referencing Harlock in some way, they give him a much more effeminate voice. And in fact, you you retweeted this this little edit of uh, Deslock's voice in Star Blazers. He just sounds like Chris Chan, and I just put his little sonichu underneath Dessler, and it, and it works. It works too well. 
Gans, what are you so excited about? Need a desk lock. Our Pluto base on Gamelon has nothing to fear from this old wreck. It's a futile gesture from Earth. They will never get that antiquated wreck to fly. But, sir, it's firing on the space battleship we sent to bomb Earth. I'd like permission to test our new Ultra Menace missile on it. A missile target? Hmm. All right, Gans, you can do that. Thank you, Leader Deslock. Uh, I don't blame the voice actor. I think the casting, they didn't want a very intimidating Hitler, I feel like. They wanted a more feminized version? I don't know. Uh, did, did you? You know what I'm talking about, obviously. Uh, they didn't want a character that sounded, uh, maybe it didn't sound too evil. Yeah, no, or not too manly. Uh, and may, and maybe like that either. was even just, uh, maybe that was even just casting to his face and not to what the character's personality was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he loses a bit of his menacing nature through that. Um, I don't, there's oh, one but you, little, but you know what I just thought about, um, because I was thinking about old anime dubs, sort of like Voltron. I wonder if they had some sort of issue, like with Voltron, I know a big issue is that they only had five voice actors. And those five voice actors had to cover everyone in the show. And yeah. so you get characters that just, here's my hokey accent because I'm voicing three other characters this episode and I'm running out of voices. Um, yeah. You have instances of characters, on a, uh, not even as a joke, male voice actors playing female characters doing falsettos and just kind of talking like this. So it's, it's, it's definitely, they were, they were hocking it together and then we don't even know who the full cast was for star blazers that there are people who have been lost to time that we just don't know who did the voices for those so the localization process was definitely uh, a lot sloppier back in the day no doubt i will say one other fun fact uh in the original story treatment iskandar the reason why that they, they don't just move the human race there it's because the atmosphere is too pure and that humans need a little bit of a pollution or they can't hack it. Now, they had Mamoru staying on the planet, so I didn't really bring that up. But I thought that was interesting that it kind of plays into the corrupting mother thing, too. It's like, this is too pure. Humans can't exist in this hyper-pure thing that you guys want in your water planet. Humans are a little gritty. I kind of like that. That like it, How we juxtapose versus the Garmalos versus the Iskandarians... I thought that's a nice little story touch to me. That's interesting because I wonder um, in that original treatment were Iskandar and uh, Gamalos, were they supposed to be twin planets that were sort of like dependent on each other? Because, I mean, it makes sense in the final version why they don't just stay on Iskandar because if Gamalos is destroyed, Iskandar goes with it, essentially. I actually suspect that the twin planets, the Gamalos and Iskandar thing, I feel like that has to be a Matsumoto thing because... Mm. I don't know if you've noticed, but Matsumoto likes his twin planets that orbit each other. Um, Harlock had it. Um, I've also been watching the Galaxy Express 3.9 TV show, and I I think it's episode 14, maybe. There's an episode uh, the twin uh, with twin planets, and it's a very important episode. I'm actually surprised how early it happens, where Tetsuro mm -hmm. um, winds up on this twin planet where people ha can switch bodies, and he switches bodies with a woman, and he actually gets his mechanical body, but it doesn't look like him. And he's like, oh no, this isn't my body. I still want to have my body. The twin planets in that episode are played more like a Sodom and Gomorrah type thing where they mm. intentionally kind of, they mistreat their travelers. And as a result, at the end, they're destroyed because of it. Right. And I was trying to see if they did something similar in Yamato, but it, in Yamato, it's not as much of a Sodom and Gomorrah. It's more of a yeah. light side, dark side. At the end, you know, the travelers arrive and then after they leave, it's destroyed, you know, and there's like this no looking back sort of like, you know, you can't look back at Sodom and Gomorrah when it's being destroyed or else you'll turn to a pillar of salt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Gamalos definitely takes that kind of hit. Uh, and Iskandar is already fucked. They, they definitely leave both planets in ruins. Now, at the end of the anime, it's more hopeful because humanity is going to repopulate Iskandar. So it's got that whole, you know, intergalactic breeders angle going on uh and the <laughs> endings are all i mean i think it's cool that we can talk about how all these endings are so dynamic and different but 
it still kind of feels the same to me. It's got that it's got that Toki that. Wa value about it that is in all of Matsumoto's work where it doesn't really connect, but it does if it because the entire universe is just rotating in time and events are just happening in slightly different order. I mean, you can maybe that this is a a, a moment the seed of that idea really taking place. To quote the uh, special features of the Phantom Menace DVD, it's like poetry, it rhymes. <laughs> I think that's a beautiful ending to the episode in a lot of ways. But do you have any final thoughts on on Yamato and and maybe even thoughts on what the future of it looks like and where it goes from here? Maybe tease us with it. I don't know. Well, I'll say this. I uh, I was a bit critical when I first watched the original Yamato. I think it's a, a beautiful show and I think it, it, it clearly inspired a lot of things that would become you know, it may not be my favorite anime, but I can see how it inspired my favorite anime. Um, I think it's an inconsistent show, but I think that if you're someone who even cares a little bit about anime history, it's it's a gorgeous show. It has great characters, and I definitely recommend it for anyone who's interested in historical aspects of anime or even just animation in general. Yeah, it definitely marks an important period, it, and it and it marks an important moment in America's experience of anime as well. Shaping the minds of young people. I, I have to give some props to Tim Eldred. Obviously, I'm looking at rstarblazers.com as we're doing this. I mean, uh, he we did an interview with him and he pointed out, you know, this was a serial adventure. And in the 70s, we were watching everything was a Scooby-Doo clone essentially. Nothing was episodic. Nothing went episode to episode. It was the same thing over and over again. Whereas Yamato was not that. It stuck out like a sore thumb in a lot of ways. And it it gave a generation of boys in America one of their first tastes of like episodic adventure, you know, and it kind of proved that kids are smart enough to follow this stuff if you give them a chance to follow this stuff. And I mean, is it too far removed from that idea in Japan too? Star Blazers is actually, you'd be surprised. It's pretty far from one of the first anime to come over because uh, there's a lot of anime from the sixties that are in black and white. And even in the early seventies that did make their way over, but you are onto something with the serialized story where it was mm. one of the first ones to get that serialized story. Because if you look at all the other anime that came over, you're looking at like, Gotcha Man became Battle of the Planets. That's an episodic adventure. You know, Astro Boy is episodic. Speed Racer is episodic. Uh, there's like the Tezuka movies that got dubbed in the in the 70s. And those are also like standalone stories. They're not related to any kind of franchise. So every really a lot of anime up until Star Blazers was episodic. And I know a lot of people say that that's what got them into Robotech was Robotech was mm -hmm. the first cartoon they saw where it was a serialized story. Um, and but Star Blazers, of course, predates it a little bit. Um, so Star Blazers is really uh, for the generation before Robotech. That's it's the real boomer core anime in America. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely not one of the first, but I don't know. Is it within the first 10? Really? I mean, I, I, I doubt I seriously doubt to, that. Yeah. OK, maybe color. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I'm splitting hairs until I'm right. But uh, I guess it's it's it made a bigger impact, I think, than many of the other anime that had come uh, rivaling, you know, we Astro Boy, Speed Racer, Star Blazers. Uh, those are kind of the three first anime. I think that most people would if you were thinking about what are the first animes that are important to America, would those three kind of be it? I would throw in Battle of the Planets, though. Um... Because okay, I, I think, okay. I, what's his name? Uh, I think it's Alex Ross is like the comic book artist. He he credits a lot of his style to watching Battle of the Planets. So I, I would say that's there. It's definitely coming. before Voltron. So I think if we're talking about the three most formative anime in America, we're talking Astro Boy, Speed Racer, Star Blazers. I don't think much else. I think Battle of the Planets was close, but I think Star Blazers outshines it in a, in a way that kind of covers battle of the planets in a lot of ways well definitely but i don't quality know. sake of battle i i don't i don't think very highly of battle of the planets as an adaptation <laughs> unlike speed racer which i think is amazing star blazers and speed racer star blazers and robotech they maintain that yeah. japanese dna that's intrinsic to the work right the story still got told it didn't get as butchered 
as you know, as like a yeah. trans or Z or something. So yeah, I mean, that's, it's important to America. It's important to Japan. It's understated in modern day for a lot of reasons. Maybe Voyager Entertainment could be blamed for that in some ways. I'm not holding them to the same fire I would hold Harmony Gold, but I think the fact that it wasn't, of it has, it isn't really available. It's stuck on these DVDs that they've got a warehouse full of that are overpriced and hard to get a hold of. Maybe some grievances there. I don't know. Do you share any of those with me? I have grievances. I mean, that's, I mean, that's being a Robotech fan uh, where you, yeah. and it, it sucks because in, in the case of Robotech fans, I am a fan of those original 85 localized adapted episodes. I think that Robotech even as an adaptation is very good. And I enjoy it a lot. I, in the case of even the second series, they adapted Southern cross. I think that the, the Robotech version is better than the Japanese in that one's case. Robotech is also the reason why Macross doesn't come over uh, yeah. because of all the the rights issues between studio new way, harmony gold and big West advertising. Yeah. And it's not even that bad with Voyager. It's just, they won't loosen up. They won't let it stream. They still are getting enough money from these DVD sales, I guess. So God bless them, but please let people watch the original anime. It's not, please stop hiding it behind a DVD. Uh, that's made, that is not made making this episode any easier. I'll say that. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that in your research. Is I don't think you own all the Voyager DVDs, do you? I don't. Uh, no, I don't. But I see. I can. I can easily. Uh, uh, let's say I'll Captain Harlock my way into finding some episodes. <laughs> exactly. If I yeah, need to. Yeah. yeah. If if we have to. Yeah. We definitely had to. So please make it easier for people to watch the original Star Blazers of Voyager Entertainment. I'm begging you. That's about all I have to say. That's my final plea for Star Blazers, for Space Battleship Yamato, the quest for Iskandar. I hope you'll join us maybe when we talk about, the, I think it's the Comet Empire is next. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to covering the rest of the series. Yeah, and actually I did want to watch the uh, the film I Know Senshi, which is the, the second Yamato film. So so I'd be down for that. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, this is a, uh, in in a lot of my old videos, I before I had even seen Yamato, I had mentioned it in YouTube videos, the the first film because of how important it was historically, and uh, because the names are kind of difficult for an outsider to pick up on, I I found out that in like two or three videos mentioned in passing the first Yamato film, but showed clips of the second, and no one called me out on it. <laughs> I know now, I know now. Oh, that's the second one. But in my, yeah. uh, I'll always think about how, like, I think that's one. That's another reason that's a little hard to get people into Yamato is that the titles are not conducive to no. seeing it and knowing that's the first one, right? Yeah, I've posted movie posters of of Space Battleship Yamato movies incorrectly, calling them the incorrect one. Uh, I think it is Farewell to Base, uh, Space Battleship Yamato. I think that is the second one. So that's, uh, they called it a Rivadarci uh, Yamato in, in Italy. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> we're both Italian. We, uh, there's some, there's some Italian romance going on. It looks like a big spaghetti. It looks like it's covered in red sauce. That's all I'm saying about the Yamato. It's delicious. Anyways. Mm. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for putting up with me and, and watching all the Yamato, so much Yamato. I think we did a good job of covering it. Uh, that's, that's it for this. I'm going to is it the right arm over the heart. Yeah. I'm going to give a, a Yamato salute and uh, later, y'all. Thanks a lot. And and go check out Mercury Falcon. Do you have anything you want to plug? Other? I think we talked about your last video. Go watch his last video. Anything else? Go check out his Patreon, by the way, too. Do that. Support Mercury Falcon. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you if you join, you know, uh, if you join the Discord, uh, a lot of times I'll just get random anime things, uh, rare production stuff translated. Um, and I just uh, I started just posting that in my discord. I have a, just a, a in the server. I have a channel that's just translations. So, uh, yeah, if you're ever, ever curious about a topic I talked about, if you want to see the translations, they're probably in the discord. So um, I think I think uh, I think it's one of the lower tiers to get into the discord. But, yeah, uh, we have a bunch of people there all talking about retro stuff. So, uh, yeah, so I'm there. Come on, come on and join us. Join me too. I, I use his Discord like it's my Discord sometimes. And it's just uh, a lot of fun to, to hang out and talk about old anime with people who, who share that. So definitely check out 
his Patreon, his Discord, and his awesome anime resources. That's it for this episode of the free Arcadia podcast. Join us next time. Who knows what we'll be talking about. I appreciate you all out there in the Liegeverse. I'll see you.